All right, it looks like it is six o'clock. So we'll call a meeting to order. It's Monday, December 13th of 2021. This is the Stoughton Plan Commission meeting. And we do have a quorum. Uh, the first item would be to consider approval of the Plan Commission meeting minutes of November 8th of 2021. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Make that motion. Second the motion. Okay, a motion by Robinson and a second by Schumacher. Any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of the minutes say aye. 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 Any opposed to the minutes? That motion carries. Next item is a city council representative report. All the person Caravello, do you have anything to report tonight? Uh, just one item looks like on the or at the November 23rd City Council meeting R170 of 2021 relating to the new pizza restaurant on Main Street was approved. And that's all I've got. All right. Thank you. Uh, staff report. Um, as standard, uh, continuing your packet is a, a report of some of the more recent projects. I don't know if there's anything of particular note to highlight other than there is construction going on on several of the last projects. Uh, obviously, the Weevil World is well underway on the east side of town. Construction on um, parcel on 314 West Main for the two four units is underway and visible. So those those are two of them. And Starbucks is now open for business. I think it's at least worthy of noting that has taken place and the Pizza Hut operation has switched into their new facility and opened up at that location as well. Thank you, Director Shield. Any questions on the staff report? Do we know if anyone has had any inquiries on the other pizza, on the old Pizza Hut building? I see they did re remove that cupola off of there and have a, a realtor sign in the front. Yeah, we, we, we did get some indications that somebody's looking at that building. Um, first first uh, inquiry was about a potential child care facility. Um, don't know if that's going to materialize, but somebody's looking at that property for daycare slash child care. Yeah, we have a okay. public hearing set up for January already for that. All right, it's a great location. Any other questions on the staff report? All right, hearing none, we'll go to uh, item five, which is the facade improvements at 143 East Main Street. And you might recall this was <coughs> at the last meeting and we had a couple uh, questions or comments for the, for the owners of the business. Um, anything to update us on, Director Scheel or, uh, or, um, or Michael? Yeah, I think I think the picture probably highlights it best. Um, the package outlines what they've they've shown as as a change. They're really hoping to keep the door colored as it is shown, uh, but they are looking at uh, potentially changing the the um, border around it and the the roof above the door, if you will. So they did they did propose some color changes to take into consideration comments from the commissioners from last meeting. So they're looking for your support. So I can also share with you what the screen looks like now if, or, or what it looks like now, just to compare the two, if you'd like. I, I'd like that. Yeah. So here's, here's the current color scheme as it is currently. And we'll go back to what it was or what it's proposed to be. Never went back. I know I'm, I'm struggling here for a minute. All right. <laughs> We're going to get there, I think. Is it spinning? It's working on it. Um, well, what, well, Rodney is, is there we go. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately wasn't able to make the last meeting. And so I wasn't part of the discussion on the door, but 
Um, I honestly don't mind the darker blue um, and might even prefer it to that gray. Um, the gray seems kind of washed out to me. I, I, and I, I personally have a bigger issue with the, the salmon color um, that dominates the lower portion of the facade and the door on the left-hand side of the building. Um, even though I know that's an attempt to color the brick above, um, I actually think that that makes the front of the building look lopsided because it kind of draws your attention to that left-hand corner, the left-hand side of the building, if you have the whole building picture up on the screen. Um, and um, I think it draws too much, from a business perspective, I think it draws too much attention to that left side of the facade and that left door versus the front door that you want to draw attention to. Um, so I'd rather have, I, mean, I don't mind a little bit of that salmon to pull down the color of the brick that's up above, um, but I think it's way too much in that particular location. And that's a bigger issue for me. I don't mind that dark blue that was there at all. Um, and in fact, the, the really light blue, I think starts to wash out when you've got tail, tailgaters next door. Um, I think it would be even be better if where the light blue is or that kind of grayish blue color is above the, the uh, transom window um, if that was the same white as the band that goes across and the white brick above um, and and or else was um, a darker um, gray or almost black like the the metal around the windows I think then your other portions of the building like that purple door which again I have no problem with the purple door I think it would draw your eye to that and would look artsy like they're looking for I think there's just too much color going on, even in this this proposed revision. Well, Todd, I'm going to agree with you. I think <clears throat> I I didn't mind the uh, surround that door being the dark blue, and I think it actually looks better. Uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, I can see what they were trying to do with that that collar down below, trying to match the break up above. So I, I really don't mind that so much. That seems to be consistent with what we're looking for. Todd, it was me that uh, that brought up the the difference in the surround color of the door. Um, the reason that I didn't think that. The, the darker color uh, on the ceiling and around surrounding the door was as good of an idea was because it really darkens that doorway because that's such a deeply recessed doorway. Mm -hmm. um, that, that'd be the only reason, just, just to brighten that vestibule up just slightly. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess I can see that, but I think the reason that you think that that door recedes is in part because you've got the the light blue or the blue gray um, that's above and around it and then you've got that that um, brick color to the left um, so you, your eyes end up going over there instead of to the door and and I think if you want the door to look artsy rather than washed out um, like I'm afraid it does it to some extent in the the new revision I, I think it would be it might behoove them more to change your focus on the colors of those other two areas and still be able to have that door be really kind of a bold color, even though it is darker. It's a nice, bold, artistic color. And at first I thought, when I first looked at it, I thought the blue and the purple didn't go well together. And maybe on a facade, that might be my more traditional approach, but I think from an art perspective, the two colors probably do. My daughter would probably tell me that they go together because she's the artist. All right, any other comments from commissioners? What I'm seeing now, there it goes. Now it's back, Rodney. Thank you. <clears throat> I, uh, I missed the last month's meeting also. I apologize for that. Uh, and, and I saw there was some guidance on colors matching the exterior architecture. 
uh, I, I guess just a, a quick note uh, from my military experience with the Navy, you know, we had a base exterior architecture plan that was pretty defined as to what exterior colors and uh, even materials were allowed. Um, I, I guess that's something that's never been considered for downtown as a question. Um, we, we actually do have that. So it's, it's, it's in fact, uh, sections of that ordinance are included behind um, these submissions here to kind of give you that context, but it's, we don't specifically regulate and say it has to be from this particular color palette. It just has to be colors that are um, uh, consistent and, and compatible and consistent and, and work well with the architectural materials on the building like that original brick and don't clash or contrast too dramatically from neighboring properties. But you yes, I, I saw that. It just, it seemed to be, and I apologize, this is a, a newbie here. Um, it seemed to be very subjective and, and would lead to discussions like we're having of, you know, well, I like this color, I don't like that color. Um, very subjective as to each individual's preference, I guess. Um, it, 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 I can see here it is subjected to a point, but it also is it, it offers flexibility and freedom versus if it just said choose from these 12 colors, um, which you can do from a more military perspective, um, but it, it, it's hard to pass muster in a public setting like this. Oh, okay, copy that. Any other comments from commissioners? I, I agree with the comments of Commissioner Barman. All right, so what do we have to do in order to act on this? Do we have to put something in the motion or do we just do a motion? I really don't wanna have to bring it back at the next meeting unless you guys feel that's necessary. Um, I, I, would, I would move um that um the property owner can stick with the two colors that they have chosen for the door and the immediate door surround um but the total number of colors on the building need to be reduced um and and i because it just just there's two now too many colors on the front of the building and we do we do speak to the quantity and number of colors in the ordinance and so I would suggest that more of that off-white or cream from up above be used to replace some of the extra colors in the bottom of the facade, um, such as that light gray or that blue gray, and some of the salmon color like on that door to the left, just to um, reduce the amount of, of color clutter. Does, does the ordinance remind me, does it specify a number of colors? My, my recollection was they, they say your color palette should be close to three to four colors and, and maybe Rodney or Michael remember. Um, but I thought, I thought there was reference to trying to keep the color the colors at least on the facade, not necessarily any particular sign, because that gets into logo issues. Michael, can you see if there's a specific number? Here's some of the language of the code right here in this in this paragraph that's on the screen now. Uh, but I don't know if it, it enumerates a, a specific number or maximum number. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was three, but um... it says when in doubt on an appropriate palette, use shades of one color with one highlight color. I mean, so you could almost argue that that sounds more like two, but I thought it was more in the, you know, three range. Yeah. But right now we've got but I thought. Um, quite a bit more than that. Yeah, six colors. Here, here the next page actually has a sentence on it that's on the screen now. There we go no more than three different colors for each structure yeah. on the property yeah. and that's and that's talking about primarily the architectural elements versus like signage yeah. 
So at this point, you're not concerned about the colors, you're concerned about the number of colors. Is that what the motion well, is about? I expressed my subjective opinion on the 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 brick, the salmon kind of brick color on the left and that, that blue that's kind of a remnant. Um, but I think the primary from an ordinance perspective is to reduce the palette. And I certainly would not suggest that they take that dark blue and the purple and then spread that around because I think it makes sense for that to be the highlight color. Um, and it would, would not look good to spread that. But I think taking that cream, even if all they did was take that cream on the upper facade and replace that blue or, or light gray, and maybe to, and then, then that to me would help a lot. All right, so you started to make a motion. So we need to kind of tweak it so we can get something that's approvable, but yet gives them some direction. Okay. Well, if I remember correctly, my motion was that to approve the purple door color and the dark blue door surround with the stipulation that the total number of colors on the overall, overall facade be reduced. Um, and, and the suggestion being to use the cream from above. Okay. The cream or off white. So it'd be reduced consistent with the ordinance. And and some of the other colors on the building, yes. Okay. Is does that give you enough direction, Michael? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? If if I can just offer something, because looking at this picture that's up now, and I'm visualizing that picture with the salmon, where it's that salmon color if that was all that light gray, then that purple door would really pop out. That that would be another option too, because then it wouldn't be quite so lopsided with it leaning left the way it is now. Uh, that, you know, just, just a thought. Well, I, hopefully no. the, the motion gives them the flexibility to do that. I think the main point of it is we have too many colors in that you'd probably like to see more of the light color and less of the salmon. Yeah. So I, I will second the motion if nobody has yet. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, any more specifics on that or you think that's enough? I think that gives us an opportunity to give us some additional guidance, yes. Okay. And I'm good. I'm willing to acquiesce to that. All right. Anybody else? Well, well, you're you're approving the the dark blue and with a purple door, but you're also suggesting that the light gray could work. Where um, the salmon where the salmon color is. Where the salmon color is, or the cream color could work. So that's not part of the motion. That's just a suggestion. Um, my 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 motion included the stipulation that the total number of colors in the building needed to be reduced, though. Yes. For the, yep, for the approval it. of two new colors. And yep. my personally, I, I would say no. I don't agree that that light blue or gray, um, not necessarily what they've shown around the purple, because that's just a simulation. I'm talking about the stuff around the transom. Um, to me, that's an odd color that doesn't fit anything else that's going on on the building. So let's, let's summarize what the motion actually is, because it's to get to a reduce the number of colors and you threw some options out, and is that really as far as the colors? Uh, is that all we need is for to make this motion work? I would look for Rodney or Michael to ask if that kind of a motion is specific enough. You're gonna you're gonna have more than three colors, <laughs> unless the purple. 
or the salmon goes away. I mean, right now you're going to have what well, you got the the cream color, you've got the gray, you've got the purple, and the salmon. So you've already got four colors on the building, right? And well, the color of the awnings. There's there's well the awnings they're removing. Things are going away. Yep. And they and it's actually a dark blue currently around the purple door. Yeah. And right. so. Um, and you have the black trim of the windows. Yep. There are six colors on this building. <laughs> At least. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just I hesitate to tell them, okay, now you have to paint the left door cream and you have to paint um all the, the blue gray has to be also cream. Um, because then I'm making all the design choices for them. Um, I mean, unless you think it has to come back, I mean, they're not planning to paint till spring. And, and so I guess we could have them come back to the commission and show us what those would look like trying to get this down to three at most four colors and allowing them to keep the two, the <laughs> two colors around their door that they originally chose. I mean, if you, they're not going to paint in January anyway. Is the applicant online? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Somebody, somebody phoned in. I'm not sure who that is. Okay, it might not be the applicant, right? Can we not uh, send it back to him and just say three is the max color? Give us uh, a few options if you want to expedite the next review. Yep. All right. So then we have to have a motion to postpone until they do that. Move to move to postpone. Your second. I'll second that. All right. Any discussion on that? I think we kind of beat it to death. Yeah. Just just as long as we can share the information that we've discussed with them, or if they can listen to this tape recording. Yep. <clears throat> all right. Sounds good. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Thanks. Uh, we'll probably see it next month. Uh, next item, number six, is the uh, plan development, uh, general development plan rezoning for the Stoughton Riverfront redevelopment project area. Uh, we do have a need for a public hearing. I know there's a couple of people that are available to speak. Um, this has gone through, I believe, the RDA. Um, <coughs> probably some of the council members have seen this as well. Um, but I, I don't know if it's been here, at least in this shape or form. Where do you want to start with this one, Rodney? Yeah, I, I'll just recap where we're at. So the um, council and the RDA did approve a GDP application. So the applications before us now is a, a rezoning to the GDP standard. So that's what's before us, the rezoning to the GDP. Um, uh, Kurt Brink and his team are here, and I, I think Doug Hirsch was going to give a an overview. Uh, what's shown on the screen now is uh, very similar to what the Planning Commission, Council, and RDA have seen um, in recent layouts. But I, the I just screen is just the agenda. Oh, thank you. Sorry. There it is. So, speaking just to the general layout, the general layout is very consistent with the configuration, building positions. Um, the stormwater area along the river, uh, those are, uh, see, th this is essentially the, the layout that's been seen by the community for a number of months. Um, but what's before us right now is putting the zoning in place to accomplish the, the building setbacks, the building positions, um, and the like. So in the, res in the rezoning ordinance that's before you tonight, the exceptions when we compare this zoning district to an MR24, which is our multifamily high density residential, you'll see the exceptions are written to um, utilize that as a baseline standard. Um, the GDP zoning classification allows us to establish standards specific to this particular track of land. And that's what's being accomplished by going through the general development planning process that we, we have before us right now. Um, I think there's an opportunity uh, to turn this over to Doug Hirsch. I think 
uh, Doug would maybe provide a, a little more insight into uh, their design theme and discuss the, the project as a whole and or Kurt Brink or, or Matt Brink who is also online. So I don't know who wants to take over, but we can certainly share the screen with whomever. Mayor, I've got one, one point of order before we move into this item. Sure. Um, in the previous item, we had a motion and a second that was on the table that we didn't do anything with. We decided to uh, redo mm -hmm. the entire and have a second motion and second, and we didn't actually get rid of the first one. I think the the motion to postpone kind of supersedes that. Okay. But yeah, because once we table it, there's no reason to go back and vote on the first one, I think is the rationale. Got it. All right, but no problem there. Um, so who would like to do the presentation here? I, and I know we do have one other person that has called in. So um, after okay. the presentation, we'll probably go into the public hearing, but we might as well do the background first, I would think. Um, this is Kurt, can you hear me? Yes. Can you? Okay, I'll, um, Doug will present the overall plan. We also have here on um, board John Thousand, our civil engineer, and Rebecca DeVore from um, Saki and Associates for our landscape, and then Matt Brink for other issues. So I'll um, I'll give it to Doug Hirsch now from Potter Lawson. So he's the head of their team right now, and he'll go through uh, what we're um, putting presenting for the GDP. All right, thank you. And I think Doug, you should be able to share your screen. Um, okay. Looks like it's it's up. You can see that. Great. Yes. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> we're happy to be here to kind of share the GDP plan that we've been working on for maybe a year and a half now um, with the RDA. Um, the idea for the the plan has evolved, kind of as we've gone through the process. But the idea has always been to make this development sort of an extension of the city, an extension of Stoughton and a part of Stoughton, not you know, a standalone development. Um, I believe we have about 215 apartment units kind of shown on this um, site plan. And the, the majority of the buildings are between three and four stories tall. Uh, they all are designed to take underground parking so that we reduce the amount of parking um, on the site, and we're utilizing the roads um, for additional parking in order to get up to kind of uh, the Stoughton standard. Um, without the street parking, we're below, and we've asked for that um, exception in the in the GDP. Um, a lot of the land is given over to green space, as you can see along the the river. Um, that's where we're doing our stormwater retention. Um, that's the low part of the site. That's um, the water will go there and infiltrate before it goes into the river. Um, it leaves plenty of room for the trail uh, that uh, the city is uh, developing. We also have that secondary green space that aligns with 6th Street and also aligns with the bridge over to Mant Park. So um, that area, once that part of the development gets developed, will be an easement with the city. Um, so it'll always be a green space and you always have a view kind of looking down 6th Street um, to the river, to the bridge and to Mant um, Park. I'm gonna um, see if I can get my screen, if I can move the slides. Um, I'm gonna come back to landscape. We've got um, Rebecca um, on board for landscaping. It is a um, sort of a GDP plan, so it's kind of a concept landscape plan. Um, we're planning to submit the SIP for these first two buildings um, in January. Um, so those will be moving ahead with a more specific um, landscape plan. Um, I think one of the things to maybe highlight is that um, sort of in this outlot area here, um, adjacent to the river, we're looking at indigenous um, landscaping, sort of natural landscaping in that um, in that area, as well as throughout the, the project. Um, the next drawing kind of just shows the lighting plan and the signage plan. I think 
Um, we're looking at, um, you know, pedestrian scale lights and lights that kind of relate to the kind of historic nature of this part of the city. Um, and we're also, as part of this plan, we have shown some little areas for signage um, for the project, and we're planning to utilize some of the materials from the old uh, blacksmith shop to um, create those signs and potentially have some work with the, the Landmarks Commission to come up with a way to identify and provide um, sort of interest that kind of relates back to the historic nature of, of this area, kind of within, within the projects and specifically within this kind of commons area along 6th Street. Um, I think the only other thing maybe to mention is uh, the first, this is kind of a look at the first two buildings where all the buildings might be kind of similar in layout. Um, the first two buildings will have one underground parking um, that's all connected. And then they're actually broken up into two different buildings here in the apartment layouts. And there are a fair amount of three bedrooms. It's not all just one bedrooms and studios. I think we've got a, a, around 40%, 46% three bedrooms, and then on the remainder being two bedrooms and one bedroom units. And that's kind of specified in the GDP narrative. Um, and this is uh, the view of the, of the first building at the corner of South 4th and East South Street uh, that um, harkens back to the blacksmith shop. We kind of use the blacksmith um, building facade here and sort of redesigned it, made it a little bit taller and added a kind of a third floor. And there are some loft units um, up on the, the very fourth floor there. So this building will be brick and um, cement board siding on the upper portions. The balconies are hung off kind of in a industrial manner. And then the windows are all the black um, metal. Um, they look like the old kind of historic uh, steel windows, but they won't be steel. They'll probably be fiberglass. And then the second building, um, which is on the um, South 4th and River Street, the new street that goes through the development, is a three-story building. It's a little bit lighter brick to relate to the power house building. Um, while the first building um, is replicating kind of that reddish brick on the, on the um, uh, blacksmith shop, this one has a little bit lighter brick on it. And those are some preliminary images um, of that. Um, a couple of the sustainable features that are written into the plan include um, solar ready. So for the roofs, um, the buildings will be ready to take solar and will be installed within 10 years um, of the project to, you know, make sure there's the right time to buy the solar panels. Um, and then we, we will have five years. charging stations as well. Uh, for parking um, underneath. Um, all the lighting will be LED lighting to reduce the energy consumption. Um, each unit will have its own HVAC system. Um, yeah, I think that's the majority of what I was going to say. Yep, we did. We uh, agreed in the previous meeting to go to five years. To five years, OK. Okay, so I, we, I thought I might have that wrong. Yeah, Thank we you. change. Does, um, I don't know, John or Rebecca, do you guys want to have any input on the presentation? If I can go back to the site. Plan. Always save the best for last. Yes. <laughs> I'll uh, give you a couple of minute overview of the landscape. I think Doug did a great job of talking about how the structure of the open spaces really supports that connectivity, both north, south, and then you can see east, west with the new River Street. Um, lots of pedestrian sidewalks. We're working with city forestry um, on a number of terrace 
tree planting, so a pretty significant investment in new city street trees along 4th Street, um, a small portion of South Street, but then the majority of those plantings along River Street and wrapping up to that 7th Street extension. And um, you know those tree plantings along with a bunch of plants on the specific sites that that will be submitted as part of the SIP as this project moves forward in phases, mm -hmm. really support this notion of, of kind of bringing that green from the riverfront and starting to transition it and translate it through the site and into that kind of residential um, area that surrounds the site to the north. Um, I think as Doug mentioned, um, the, the zone right along the riverfront where we have those bioretention basins we're paying very particular attention to using native species there. And then as we transition into the site, which is slightly more urban, kind of a mix of native and adaptive species um, that won't require any permanent irrigation systems um, and sort of support some of the sustainability goals of the project to shade parking lot pavements, provide pedestrian connectivity, um, support pedestrian exterior spaces, and a lot of walkability through the project and to the project. I have a question. Oh, the person by asking, go ahead. Could you explain the difference between a climax tree and a street terrace tree? <laughs> Absolutely. So a climax tree as it's defined by the city ordinance is a very tall um, tree. So think about like a big oak or a big maple or a big hackberry, something that you might see in a park or you might see in a space that has um, more root volume and more overhead canopy clearance. Um, that's not to say that street trees can't be climax trees, but it takes a certain terrace width in order to support that growth. So you wouldn't plant a climax tree, you wouldn't plant an oak in a city street terrace that might only be four feet wide or five feet wide. You'd want you know, a terrace that's eight to 10 plus feet wide to really at a minimum support those trees. Although frankly, you'd rather see those trees in, in even bigger rooting volumes. So in this particular project along fourth and south and river, we have five foot terraces. So we've worked with city forestry to define the level of street tree that would be anticipated and it, and it trends toward the sort of um, medium sized ornamental tree. So think about a larger crab apple um, oh God. or uh, an amelanchier, a service berry or something of that nature is the terraces are all <clears throat> at narrower five foot width. <clears throat> All right, um, I'm biting my tongue right now because as a the chair of the public works department, I've been talking about expanding and having required standards for our terraces and five foot terraces are just way too small, number one, to support trees of any size uh, and for snow, uh, for snow storage and, and whatsoever. And I tell you the truth, if I see another tree, another crab apple tree, or trees of that size in a area where we have a where we can have large canopies, I will scream, uh, especially along River Street, where we have a lot of open space, no utility lines, and you're going to put in crab trees. I I have a real problem with that. I'm just giving it up front. Uh, so as I know, this isn't a set plan, and that's just my own my own preferences and my own likes and dislikes, and also my own experience. Well, I think that's one of the reasons you know the general development plan is here is to get your feedback before they get to the SIP. So I'm sure that you know feedback is something that. They'd rather hear an all in later um, so they can look at, you know, working with uh, public works about other species if there's something out there that might be more appropriate. I, I can, I, you know, I understand that, you know, you're, you're trying to maximize your, 
your parking space and what's over, but on, on River Street, between the powerhouse and that first climax tree, why you cannot get a larger uh, terrace in there and get some climax trees in there, I don't know why, and I'd like to see that changed. Uh, this is Kurt, that's a good point. The trick is um, when we're putting this together, that zone around the power station uh, we'll have to work with landmarks because they've more or less given us a zone of we're inside that, uh, outside the zone, we can do that. So we can work on that terrace and that because what we've been trying to do here is with where the elevation with 4th Street comes in and River Street comes in and the heights of the power station and everything else, we're trying not to um, uh, flood it out wise. So we could work on that. Um, this is why this is helpful, right, Rebecca? We can work on that and how we move, maybe as we come in right to the power station coming up 4th Street, maybe we're tight there, but as we move beyond the power station towards 7th Street, we can expand that terrace there and put the, the bigger trees in there and meet all that. And that's one reason why we left all that area down below is more open to this, so that's that's good feedback. Rebecca, is that more feasible? And John, with us dealing with our stormwater management, we can probably achieve that on the river side of um, River Street. Is that correct, guys? My understanding is that there's a, a portion, the, the bulk of that riverfront trail is being constructed by a separate project. So that goes from the very southeast corner all the way along the river, and it actually engages and becomes sort of the city sidewalk, if you will, just to the northeast of the powerhouse. And I think that that's out for bid and that alignment is set. So at least for that first, let's call it 70-ish, 75 feet, 100, 100 feet or more, let's see, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150 feet of River Street, um, that, that pathway alignment is already set. Now we're pulling the sidewalk, the terrace sidewalk off of that. We're connecting to one of the nodes that was designed as part of that riverfront trail. And so I think um, as Kurt's mentioning that may be our opportunity to sort of bend that sidewalk and sort of gracefully arc it. Um, we depart a little bit from the more traditional street feeling of that zone, but I don't think that's an issue in that location. And as you can see, as we move further to the east, there are more larger trees sort of in those terrace pockets. Um, I do want to point out that, you know, I, I threw out crab apple. There was a cringe, an audible cringe from top from commissioner. And ultimately the the goal or the idea is that, um, you know, in working with city forestry, there are two options uh, to move the project forward at the SIP level as we get into that. The first is that the project pays for and, you know, plants the trees that are in the city terrace, in which case we work very closely with city forestry. Mm -hmm. They mark up a plan and tell us exactly what species they want and which ones they're planting and what's doing well in the city what they don't have too much of to increase diversity. And then we add those to the plans. The second path um, that could be pursued is to provide a credit of $300 per tree to city forestry. City forestry then comes up behind the project and does the plantings themselves. Either way, city forestry is, is, is selecting exactly which species of what type and what what order or what spacing they want in all of those terraces because those are ultimately public right of way. We will be having that discussion. There might also be an opportunity to add some larger climax trees south of between the, the 10 foot wide shared use, use path and the river, um, you know, east of the depot or east of the power plant. 
there, there might be some areas where it might be more suitable to have a large climax type tree uh, between the river and that trail. So there's, there's that opportunity going forward as well. Well, I think we can also look at the placement of the parallel stalls to get pockets where we could um, include the larger trees, similar to like um, Rebecca showing further to the east on River Street. Thank you for that consideration. Yeah, I'd love to see the bigger shade trees, you know, on the street as well. Providing a little bit more shade and defining the street would be awesome. The, it seems to me that the trees that you've shown in your renderings, your facade renderings, where you're showing the exterior of the building seem to be taller than what most people would consider to be crab apple height. So I think from a visual perspective, that was the, your ultimate goal was to have trees that were reaching between two stories to two and a half stories, at least the way you showed it. Um, and I know you probably have a little few more trees in your plan than you're showing in your renderings just because you're trying to highlight the building as well. Um, but right. they, they look to be a mid-story tree more than just a, a small terrace tree, so. All right. Uh, was there anything else uh, you were going to present, Rebecca, or is there something else from uh, your team, Kurt? No, I think we're fine. Um, okay. From the, uh, the riverfront, um, X number of feet along the river, you guys have proved that, and that is out for bid right now, and then we'll tie into that. That's, that is what you guys are putting in. So, but the tree feedback is very helpful here. Any feedback we get right now is to move into the SIP. Uh, it looks a great deal, so this is great feedback for us. All right, thank you for that. Any questions I, from commissioners before we go into the public hearing? I, I do have one question, if I may. Sure. Um, there is something that I see that I can't blow it up and I can't identify what it is. There is a um, behind the building that I believe is going to somewhat replicate the uh, blacksmith shop building in that that strip of parking lot that is behind it, but just uh, the, the, the hand, the cursor was just at it. There are the first parking spot right there. Those three little, those three squares were that first, what what is that? I cannot tell what that is. That's the trash uh, dumpsters in an enclosure with a gate. Okay. Is is that the is that the best? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. Where are trash dumpsters going to go? Right. Uh, seems These like. Sorry, go ahead. These would be the smaller um, dumpsters that would have to be rolled out, and then the trash truck would come in, you know, lift them up, and then back out, and then leave. It's I guess it's in a you know central location where residents from both buildings don't have to go too far um, to get to it, and it is enclosed. I, I, and I'm guessing a considerable amount of thought went into what to do with those, like where to put that. Because I'm, I'm, well, I'm guessing it, it, access for a garbage truck. But since they have the lifters, the forks, the lifters on the front, shouldn't be super difficult. But then a truck is going to have to back in and out of there. Mm -hmm. Seems like a, 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 it seems like a very convenient spot, but an odd spot all at the same time. Yes, it's always difficult to place them in the proper place and try to do it with one central one instead of two separate ones. It becomes even more problematic. So that's where then dealing with the people to remove the trash to be convenient also. 
control. I agree with you. Yeah, there would be a more, you know, a more convenient spot for the trash truck might not be as convenient for the residents. Mm -hmm. We are trying to keep it in the back of the building, which is, you know, versus on one of the street fronts. Yep. I'm just curious what that was. I couldn't actually identify it. So thank you. Sure. Any other questions before we go into the public hearing? All right, hearing none, we'll close the regular business, open for the public hearing. And Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, I think everybody that was signed up have spoken or had to, were part of Kurt's team. Yeah, I think you're correct. I think also uh, maybe Matt Brink also signed up. I'm not sure if he's, he wants to speak, but. No, this is Matt. I'm nothing specific. Okay, just wanted to make sure. So then we'll close the public hearing and then we'll reopen for our regular business. And so we are looking for a recommendation. As we mentioned, it, it did go through the RDA and the council. Um, anything unique about this recommendation, Rodney, you said it was on the zoning? Yeah, it, well, as you'll recall, this this is a GDP, so there are the exceptions are enumerated in the the ordinance as written, um, as outlined also in the plan narrative, but captured in the ordinance specifically. Um, so they're they're listed, and we can go through each of them. Um, deals with the lot area, the density, uh, number of dwelling units per acre, um, the setbacks, and and the like. So those are all captured in the ordinance. They're consistent with the language that was um, the, that is in the plan narrative that, that's been seen by both the council and the RDA as well. When I say consistent, it's exactly the same. <laughs> so um, it, it's the same language that was introduced as that, but identified specifically in the ordinance as part of the exception list. And I don't remember anything in particular that stood out from those meetings to you. You know, certainly it's a it's a redevelopment of an of an older site, and certainly there's uh, the high density. We're we're trying to accomplish that. There's certainly that that aspect of the tight setbacks, um, the tight urban urban feel is characterized in the plan as well as outlined uh, as a requirement for the exceptions to allow that to occur. Um, the higher density certainly is something that was anticipated here as well. And I think those are probably the things that stand out the most to me. Yeah, and I remember there, you know, I think part of the discussion was the parking, which they've addressed with some offsite. Um, and then the other part was there was discussion about the, the charging stations uh, for the EVs. Where are those located on here? So they're actually not lo located with, within the ordinance per se, but uh, the charging stations, as they were described, are actually in the underground parking areas of the of the building. Yeah, and I think there was some language in there for a percentage or something, as I recall. Yeah, they're certainly trying to match the standards that were identified as part of the City of Madison um, language and ordinances that were or passed by Madison. So this is capturing that as well. And then you've already addressed the solar. So I think those were kind of the main points from the RDA and then the change that was made at the council as Alder Majewski mentioned was the solar ready and to have those panels installed within five years instead of 10. So I think that was really the, the only major change which is significant, but certainly um, important. Um, anything from commissioners? Mayor, I'd like to raise my hand. This is Todd. Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, I, I could just use some clarification on what parking spaces were counted in the, the parking numbers that we received as part of this, the adjustment to the, the ordinance. Um, I'm assuming that all the um, parking lot, oh, the surface parking lot stalls are counted. I'm assuming that the stalls 
underneath the buildings um, that are part of the architecture are counted. Uh, I guess I don't know if the parking along River Street, which is more street parking, or the parking along that is identified along fourth or south, if that's actually counted in the quantities of parking available or if those are extra. Doug, did you want to take that one or do you want me to? I can take that. Okay. Um, so we were not allowed to use any of the street stalls um, in our counts um, since those are, the, this street will be a public street so it's not part of sort of our sites. Um, so in the counts and what we're asking for is the underground and in the parking stalls, um, you know, and in these drive areas, we're showing streets, uh, parking stalls. And that's in our description is um, less than Stoughton standard, but um, when we do add these street stalls in, um, including River Street, South Street, 4th Street, then we're, we have more stalls than the Stoughton Standard. And, and, and that seems, re it seems reasonable not to count this, the street parking. Um, and I'm assuming that part of the rationale, besides just wanting to have this be higher density and not have so much land devoted to parking, um, but part of the rationale for being able to have a few less stalls per unit is that um, overall you probably have more smaller units that might have been typical for Stilton development in the sense that you have more one bedroom or smaller efficiency type units in addition to some of your larger ones but um, you have a little bit different size or availability of of housing units compared to what is typical in stone, correct? Mm, I don't know the answer to that. I, as far as what we typically see um, developed in Madison, um, there's way more one bedroom units um, typically. In this development, there's a lot more three bedroom and two bedroom units than typical. Um, and, and I think the reason the reasoning for using the street stalls is that the streets are designed to have parking on them. Um, they're wide enough. Um, there's space there, you know, already. Um, so it makes sense to utilize that area versus building more surface parking in order to increase the the parking counts um, without using those street numbers. I think the other thing parking on the street does is it creates a more pedestrian friendly sidewalk um, where this, the cars provide a buffer um, for the pedestrians and um, streets that have parallel parking tend to slow traffic down. Um, so driving through the development will, you know, people will take a little bit more care and slow down and also makes it that a little bit more pedestrian friendly as well. Very good, thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay, hearing none. So um, it looks like we're we're looking for a recommendation for the for this. I think we have and to have a. We, did we open the public hearing? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, it went quick. Okay. You missed it. Did you want to speak? No, no, I'm good. <laughs> All right. So it looks like. This is, um, let's see, I'm looking to see if there's a resolution or ordinance in here. It looks like there is. Yes. I'm going to pull it up on my screen right okay, now. Thank you. There it is. It is an ordinance. That's what I thought. Yep. So at this point, I would, I would entertain a motion for the ordinance. I, I'd move to recommend that the council approve the general development plan for the area known as the Stoughton Riverfront redevelopment. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the ordinance say aye. 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 
And any opposed? None opposed, that motion carries. Thank you. And then we should try to figure out a way to get Alder Majewski, or maybe if you guys wanna to come to Public Works or something, maybe you guys can work something out. And then the next item is uh, the certified survey map. So the certified survey map really creates three parcel or well, um, an outlot in three parcels and dedicates the road right away. You'll recognize or some will recognize this is some land owned by the city, some some is owned by the RDA. Ultimately, outlot one is shown uh, along the river and will be publicly owned and maintained by the city going forward. Lot one represents phase one of the GDP area that we've just looked at. They'll be coming back with the SIP as, as was suggested in January for, all, for lot one. Lot two and lot three would be taken down and, and um, improved at a future date. However, River Street is planned to be, well, we can go through that as part of the SIP. It'd be dedicated as part of this CSM, but it would be improved to a point just beyond the lot one area with water and sanitary sewer. Actually, water would be looped through the entire River Street and back up to 7th Street to create a loop system, um, maybe a little more in depth uh, detail than you might be interested in. So this CSM is quite, quite straightforward. It represents all the land that's held both by the city and the RDA in this area and creates the parcels as shown. All right, thank you. It seems like there's a limited number of lots you can have in the CSM before it becomes a subdivision. Is that true? Yeah, the, the, we're really up against it. Five or more really creates a subdivision within our zoning district. Um, not that we're really looking at it any differently than that, other than not having to go through a preliminary plat and a final plat. We're utilizing the CSM to accomplish uh, the lot configuration as shown. All right. And was there anything that the Brink team wanted to add to the CSM or any thoughts about it? This is uh, John Thousand. I'm, uh, I'm the one who created this CSM uh, as, a, as the land surveyor. Um, the one thing to your point about any more lots, uh, Rodney is absolutely correct. We are up against it here with the four lots. Um, however, you know, it, if we ever wanted to do another CSM and, and possibly break up lots two and three, you know, that's possible legally in the future. We just can't do it right now. Okay, thank you for that. Um, anything from any of the commissioners? I'm sorry, I can't see you all at once. So if you have something, go ahead and let me know. And I'm hearing none, so I guess I would look for a recommendation on the CSM. And this one here is uh, set up as a uh, resolution. So I, I guess I would entertain a motion for the resolution. Move to approve resolution. All right, thank you, Alder Majewski. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alder Schumacher. Any discussion on the resolution? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed, that motion carries. Is this on for tomorrow night then, right? The resolution is not, the CSM is not. The first reading is being introduced on the GDP rezoning. That's right. Just in being introduced as a first okay. reading. All right, thank you. Uh, see, see you guys again tomorrow night then maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone very much. Okay, item number eight is um, signage change at 135 West Main Street, Suite 100. 
Um, who wants to talk about this one? I can certainly just give a quick summary. Um, it, it's a situation where this is already in, in place, uh, signage related to uh, a building on Main Street, which would be covered under the downtown design guideline requirements. Um, so it's already up, but we're trying to have it brought to you at this point. Um, ironically, the, the window signage that's visible on the screen at this point, um, if that was placed on the inside of the glass, we, we wouldn't be having this discussion because that's that's really the distinction. It's signage on the exterior of the building. So um, it is before us for our consideration. All right, any questions from commissioners? Otherwise, it looks like there's a, a resolution for to approve the sign in the packet. Anybody willing to make the motion? Um, I, I can make a motion. I, I first I want to say I pre appreciate the clarification, Rodney, that the reason this is on the agenda is because it's on the exterior uh, of the window. Because I was curious, because I know if it was on, if it was interior ply, we wouldn't even be having a discussion. Um, but I would I would move to accept. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by I think it was Caravello. Yep. All right. Any discussion? I will just say I don't like the green color, <laughs> but I I see no reason to not um, not allow it. All right. Anybody else? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 And any opposed? That motion carries. All right. Thanks for bringing it to our attention, uh, Planning Department. Um, next item is number nine, Parker Cole, additional final plat extension of Isham Street to the west. So what's before you is the final plat. The, the commission and council have seen the preliminary plat, this six lot, actually seven with an out lot, six lots with an out lot, um, was approved in a preliminary plat process through the plan commission and council prior to this. Um, what's in your packet tonight is consideration of the final plat, which would create the lots. Um, you'll recognize in the packet, and I'll, I'll show it, uh, there's a resolution that itemizes a number of conditions that would need to be yet satisfied prior to um, recording of the final plat, if you will, a development agreement, um, uh, some other standards, standard language related to um, taking care of construction plans and allocation of parkland dedication is outlined here. Uh, you'll, you might recall that there's an area on the west side of the outlot that was described and required as part of the preliminary plat, and I'll show that. Uh, to be dedicated as parkland along the western edge of outlot one. Outlot one also serves as the stormwater management area for these for the street extension. Um, just to characterize uh, for for folks that don't know, uh, Isham Street was actually dedicated prior to this uh, many years ago as part of a, a subdivision, um, but was never improved. You'll see the lots along the northern edge of the plat were already platted. The western um, majority of lots shown on the screen here, um, north of Isham Street, are actually city-owned land. It backs up against the uh, the Lowell Park environment, if you will. Um, the first three lots on the east side, lot one, two, and three, just off of Page Street, are privately owned, and I think the rest of them are actually all city-owned. So. This will open up the, the rear portion of that publicly dedicated land to the north uh, and then create these six lots for duplex construction. All right, thank you for the overview. Any initial questions or comments from commissioners? Has, has this final plat changed in any way from the one that we approved earlier, the preliminary? The configuration has not changed. Thank you. And it looks like uh, developers on on the call as well as if you have any questions for for Rob. All 
All right, hearing none, uh, we do have a resolution that entertain a motion um, for the resolution. I'll make the motion to approve the resolution or to recommend to council, I mean. All right, is there a second? I'll second. Second by Caravello. Any discussion? There are none. All in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed. That motion carries. Um, item number 10 is a site plan for the portable building to house lab gas bottle distribution and storage at Cummins 1801 US Highway 51 and 138. What are we looking at here? So uh, we actually have the applicant on, online as well if there are questions. I think he he did he is available if we have some, but I'll just give you a quick overview. You'll see on the screen um, the location where this facility is being located on their campus. So it's very internal to their, their building arrangement. Um, in, Included in your packet are some ear, um, renderings, and I'll show those as well. Just one second. Let me know if I need to answer any phone or questions. Okay, thank you. Well, I thought I was going to show you some renderings that are in our packet, but my, my screen's not cooperating right now. You got the slow room today. Yeah, I do. I got something. Um, I apologize. If you guys want any questions or any description of it, basically it's a 20 by 10 foot concrete pad that we're going to put a prefab building on. And Mike, I think I was emailing you. One second, I think I'm going to get it up, get it on the screen here in a moment. So, and then inside this building, there's going to be um, what's being described as lab gas. What is that? It's span gases. So, Cummins, it's CO, CO2, it's a prefabricated building that has all the safety measures inside of it of and detectors to you know make sure everything's good so if there's an issue it, it alerts you is that is that kind of the idea yes and well go ahead and and is this something that have you had any conversation with like the fire department Do they have any concerns over it or Mike knows Todd and Todd has worked with SPX and the fire department and our other integrated uh, external contractors to come on. So I'm really struggling here with my computer. You want me to share it? Yeah, like if that can work, that'd be great. If I screw this up, it's your fault. <laughs> Take full blame. You guys see that? Yes. Let me move this out. So there's three, there's flammable, inert gases, toxic. Each room has their own safety devices throughout everything. Is this something that you currently have there and you're adding or is this a new item? This is a new item. It's like a, a shipping container basically, but a very, very fancy shipping container. Probably an expensive one too. Yeah.
how many cylinders do you plan to keep in in this of, of the various types? Uh, I can get to a different screen. I think it's going to hold 28 different gases, which we already have on site, but they're all going to be monitored outside. So we already have all these gases. It's just going to be outside and then ran into the building. Okay, so it's not any anything in addition to what your current operation is. It's just relocating them to the outside. Correct. It's a double-edged question, right? So Kinda. it is, there's going to be a different PPM level for a couple of things, but other than that, it's, it's actually better than what we have currently. If I can pull this up. Yeah, all the person Schumacher is our resident scientist. Well, if he's a resident scientist and he hasn't been to Cummins, come on, man. <laughs> I'd love to take a tour. Let me let me see if I can pull this up. So I'm at least happy within the three doors that you've got your flammable and your oxidizer separated by other things. I'm assuming you're putting a policy in place to, to strictly limit where which of the rooms any of those gases are to enter, or is that handled primarily by air gas or whomever you have uh, supplying? That'll be a policy. Got it. Just like nowadays. Right. And I'm assuming you also have a safety training for high pressure cylinders. Oh, yes. All right. Good. That's been there for a while. Fantastic. Have you ever had any incidents with gas cylinders? I no. Not on our site. How about you, Brad? Have you had any? I have in in uh, the only place that I have ever seen the result of one were. Um, a little bit lower pressure, so they weren't the the really really high pressure compressed gases like these. It was just um, um, compressed liquid natural gas, and one of the stems had busted off of there. And uh, I saw what uh, what havoc that wreaked. It, it just it blasted straight through uh, a concrete block wall. If anybody would have been in there, they'd have been dead. Yeah, liquid nitrogen. So there's no, there's not going to be any liquid nitrogen in here. No, this was liquid uh, uh, propane. Oh, no, we don't have that. And most of our facility already has a, a big bottle and things like that. So what are you showing us now? I'm um, showing Brett the gases. Right, Brett, this is what you wanted? Yep, this is what I was looking for. I guess, I mean, my most concerning ones are, well, always the pure oxygen, because that it always has the potential to really wreak havoc with, with anything that might be uh, flammable. Well, um, Go ahead, Brad. But again, you're going to keep those separate from from one side to the other. Um, the only other one would be uh, your your ammonia that would be in there. I mean, yep. I know you're going to have monitors on on all these sorts of things, um, but that's definitely one to to keep an eye on. I mean, not that we know CO2 to be inert, but um, it does uh, put or it does have a potential asphyxiation hazard in there which I'm sure you guys have in your cylinder training. Well, that's why we we moved this building outside so that 
normal employees that are not actually in the building are separated. It's not like an office building. Sure, sure. No, nope, it's a good idea to to move them at least out into into open air. All right, thanks for sharing that. Any other questions about this, or I, I imagine Rodney it meets all the setback requirements and everything like that. Yep, we're comfortable with this those zoning requirements. Yes. Okay. Um, any questions from commissioners? Um, here and on, it looks like we do have a, a resolution on this one. I'll make the motion to approve to council. All right, is there a second? I'll second. Second by uh, Caravello. Uh, one last chance for discussion. This won't require council action. It's just a site plan re resolution. Oh, okay. Motion. Oh. No, I got to do it for the building, Mike said. Okay. All right. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, none opposed. That motion carries. Thanks for being here and sharing your screen. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Okay, um, next item is um, site plan for the new building access at, is it Sinobec Resources? Sinobec? Yeah. So what do we have for this one? This is a access, isn't it? It is. So this is a former, uh, NAFA building out on Glacier Moraine, I believe. And it sounds like at least the first thing they wanna do is provide an additional access point. Actually, you mean there's an access point into that cube? Um, so the driveway access off of Glacier Moraine is there currently. What they're proposing to do as part of this is create another truck access to the north end of the building as shown on the graphic. I think you can see my screen now. I, I'm yep. a, okay. Um, so they're proposing to put a door there and have additional driveway for turning movement for that vehicle to be able to access on the site. You'll recognize as part of the resolution that's included in your packet, there's a number of things that we, we highlighted that we think are still appropriate to include as part of the approval. Um, and I'll just read them off if, if you don't mind. All current and proposed driveway parking, loading, and access areas shall be paid by August 1, 2022. All landscaping shall be brought into compliance with city ordinances by August 1 of 2022. All exterior lighting shall be brought into compliance with city ordinances by August 1, 2022. Stormwater management areas shall be brought into compliance by July 31st of 2022, um, which requires some additional submittals and any other requirement listed within the staff review letter. So our staff review letter really talked about the, um, the items that we've, we've enumerated up above as well. But for the folks that aren't or weren't here when the North American Fur building was constructed, there was a number of expectations uh, that that operation went bankrupt. Um, we've been continuing to try to pursue those and bring those into compliance. This new building owner, property owner, um, is still working with one of the same people, but yet we're highlighting the need to bring these things into compliance and believe as a result of the request to make modifications to the site plan, uh, this offers us, us another avenue to bring at least these aspects into compliance. All right, any questions or comments from commissioners? So my understanding is the the new owner of the building they do is that aluminum wholesaling is that what I've heard? Yes, correct. And at this point, we haven't heard any plans for expansion of the building, have we? 
we have we haven't heard of any expansion plans or any plans to sell off, if you will, the excess land that they might have on this parcel. Um, but that certainly might be something that would be considered if they find that that surplus land offers value to them to be sold off. Okay. And if they give me a timeline as far as, as doing this work, uh, they want to do it as soon as they can. Um, you'll you'll recognize some of the, the dates that we put on would require asphalt paving, which can't be done until next year. But uh, certainly, uh, their hope is to be able to do this very quickly. Okay. All right. Uh, haven't had any questions from commissioners, so um, there is a resolution here. We're we're looking for. Um, it, this is considered a site plan, so this would just need to be approved by the plan commission. So I would entertain a motion. Make that motion. Okay, a motion by Robinson. Is there a second? <clears throat> second it. Okay, second. And uh, I, I wanted to thank Rodney and Michael for including uh, these outstanding items into the resolution. I think it's important that we, you know, we get this stuff done. I, I know you guys, you know, have it as an ongoing thing in the staff report, but, you know, we like to get closure on some of these items. So, you know, we can focus on the next project. So thanks for including that in there. Sure. Anything from commissioners? Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 And any opposed? And that motion carries. All right, it looks like we have a few discussion items here, so I'm not really sure how deep we'll get into these. I guess that'll be up to you guys. Um, the first one is the discuss a residential density for planned developments. Uh, what do you have, Rodney? Commissioners might recall we were discussing the, the development on the Jackson Street area where there was a multifamily dwelling or multifamily facility that was being proposed of about 100, 100 plus units. Um, and there was at least a question by the commissioners about the impacts on the emergency services, police, fire, and EMS. Um, as requested, I did meet with all of the chief and EMS director um, both chiefs and the EMS director, and they, they wanted to provide this feedback. Um, they didn't see any challenges with that specific request, but that's not the, the nature of this discussion, but I just wanted to highlight they didn't see any, any concerns about that particular type of facility. They have a, a greater concern on their services if we start to look at senior housing and, and or um, uh, non-market rate facilities. Uh, they think that there might be some impacts that would have to be discussed deeper uh, related to their, their services if those types of proposals are brought before us. Um, now that's just a general characterization. The commission at one point wanted to talk about what densities are appropriate in these GDP areas and or future multifamily sites. So we're open to, to hear what, what the discussion might be. MR24 is our multifamily or high density multifamily residential district that which equates to 24 units per acre. Um, you'll recognize we've seen uh, tonight's, tonight's another example of a general development process where we have densities that exceed that MR24 standard, but that's not inconsistent with what we've seen elsewhere. Um, the end of Hole Avenue, I believe we actually probably have a higher density than that as part of a GDP. Um, the area that we've talked about on Jackson Street, that, that's higher than the MR24. I believe the senior housing on the end of Jackson Street probably was um, higher than the MR24. So I think a number of areas where we've been able to utilize the GDP um, to the general development planning process has allowed us to exceed the MR24 standard density wise. But this group might wanna talk in more general terms about if there's an upper limit uh, of density standards that we should contemplate going forward. 
Okay, thank you for that background. Um, who wants to go first? <clears throat> All right, then I will. So I guess for my part, I think Rodney outlined it pretty well. Um, I did have some conversation with a couple of the staff members as well. And certainly when, when we're looking at the particular one where this conversation uh, kind of started, I think they did make some comparisons to uh, Nordic Ridge and it didn't sound like we really had any, any major issues over there. That's, uh, you know, as you remember is a market rate, um, multi-unit, couple buildings, fairly high density, um, really, I would say the only issues I've heard about there has just been um, some parking issues that we've tried to address through ordinances, uh, especially with larger vehicles or trailers and trying to keep them off the road. And I, I think that compliance has been pretty good since we put the ordinances in place. I haven't really heard any other you know, significant issues um, or conflicts there. Um, and as Rodney mentioned, you know, anytime we do, especially, you know, a, a senior living, uh, particularly on the uh, fire and EMS side, you know, we, we just tend to have more calls there because of the, of the, of the people that live there and, and really a lot of them, you know, are falls and those sorts of things where they might need, you know, assistance and getting people back up or transported and, and a lot of times, um, fire assist EMS in, in those types of instances. So I think that, you know, at least moving forward, I think that that would be an area where if we start exceeding our, our zoning requirements, we really want to, you know, have our staff into those conversations. And we try to do that anyway. I, I know particularly when we talked about 51 West and, and initially with that development, we talked about not only you know the calls, but really access in and out of developments, and especially high density. You know, making sure that you know we minimize the number of kind of dead ends, if you will, in cul-de-sacs, and try to you know loop it around as much as we can and maintain the width of the roads instead of having private roads. Even though sometimes the developers prefer that to minimize their costs, we don't want to sacrifice, um, you know, minimizing costs to being able to provide the services. So I think certainly in those areas, those are things that it's appropriate that we take those into consideration as part of the approval process. And certainly, you know, under our zoning, we could do that a lot easier than we can under, you know, MRs instead of trying to do it under like conditional use. I think our parameters and our ability to limit things are much less under conditional use because of the law change in Act 67. So, I, you know, I think on these multi-units, so I think that um, not only police, fire, and EMS, but we also talk to public works as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, these are private driveways, so they're not really that concerned about that unless they're on a dead end road. Uh, so I think that they're good with this as well. So those are all, you know, kind of the players that we try to bring in, especially on the newer developments. But as we'll talk about later, even on some of the existing, some of the challenges that we have run into. So that's that's all I want to add. Um, anything from commissioners, any initial thoughts or concerns? I know sustainability committee is, is looking at land use. Uh, Rodney will be doing a presentation there. And you know, high density is certainly something that, from a sustainability point, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about what that should look like, and maybe even some of the unintended consequences that come with that. So I guess this is the plan commission's opportunity to to talk about those things. If there isn't any feedback or input now, that's that's fine. Uh, if you have any going forward, and have some thoughts or some projects that you you see here or elsewhere that you thought worked well, 
um, or, or look like they are not working well, uh, we'd like that information too. So we can kind of characterize that and see if density is an aspect of that project that, that we should highlight for the commission and consider changes if necessary. I think it would be interesting at least to hear um, what thoughts the sustainability committee has with that. Um, I think if that is the gauntlet that we're going to take up, then um, what we would do then with planning should be looked at through that lens. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and I think we'll get some feedback from them. Rodney had already done one presentation, but that was more on our buildings, and we're hoping that at some point next year we can have more of a conversation about land use. I think that was kind of the direction we received, Rodney. Yeah, certainly sustainability, there's, there's land use, there's stormwater management, there's um, you know, road can, road and street configurations, bikes and trails, impervious surfaces, all those things need to be talked about in a kind of holistic manner. So that's, that's some of the discussion that I'm sure the sustainability community will be looking at. And they're still in their early stages. So at this point, they haven't really established, you know, goals or objectives or actions. Um, I suspect that they'll they'll want to get to that point. And at some point, certainly if there's some commissioners that, you know, have some expertise or some strong feelings and want to be part of that conversation, I think they would certainly welcome that input. So it's just something for you guys to think about. And as Rodney said, if you have any ideas or thoughts, you can share them with him. If you want those ideas to go to the sustainability committee. Um, you can certainly send them to them through myself, or if you want to attend those meetings, they typically will be meeting on the fourth Monday of the month, and we've been uh, videotaping some of the presentations, so uh, we can share them with you as well if that's something that you're interested in. Mayor? Go ahead. Um, I believe part of this discussion came about when we were talking about uh, the Dvorak uh, proposal that was up out there, and the, the the concern that I had was, um, you know, how much high density does, does this community want, and then what, what concentrations? Um, you know, we are. I, I certainly don't want to see us as a, as a, as a community uh, clustering high density. In, in 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 small areas, so that we have just this huge these these large pockets of uh, high concentrations of population that are are so large that we start having traffic problems and safety issues and um, and and quality of life issues, and I believe that's where this all started with and those those are my concerns yeah and i can certainly pass them on uh, i think one of the things the sustainability committee is looking at potentially is to try to do a survey and part of that survey i think you know could you know address the questions that you've raised because i think they're all good ones and if you want to be part of that discussion oh. or at least help formulate those if, questions. Um, all our person of Venegas is kind of leading um, that committee. And then there's a community member that has indicated that they're, they wanna be uh, kind of responsible for help coordinating <laughs> the survey. So we well, can help make those connections if you, if you think that's something you'd like to do or if you're in a position to do it. Here's, here's the position that, I, that I'm looking at. Um, what this really is, is, is what the root of this question is, is uh, comprehensive planning. And if I understand correctly, this commission is by state statute is to deal with comprehensive planning. Yep. Am I correct? No question. Yes. So, you know, are we taking, and I, I totally understand sustainability committee, 
And, you know, I, I, I think it's a great idea. We should be, they should be looking into things and, and giving some recommendations. However, they are not the, uh, should, and should not be the, the, the primary organization or structure to be looking at high density. It should be this commission. And I want to point off on somebody else. Okay. I think that's fair. So I guess, you know, our comp plan, you know, was done in 2017. Um, so it's a flexible thing. It is. We, and I know we you, change it. We change it all the time. We changed it for um, Kettle West. Right. So I guess the question is, is if that's, you don't have to wait 10 years to change it. You can amend it as often as you want, I believe. Yep. So I guess the question would be is, if this is an area that you want to pursue, I, how do you want to go about doing that? I, I think it is an area that we need to pursue because I'm, I'm looking at the trends and, and how uh, you're developing the, uh, the 51 corridor and uh, how things are, are, are going in, the trend they're going in right now is, is this is a, this is an issue that we should be ahead of the curve instead of uh, at the curve or behind the curve. I don't want to, like I said before, I don't want to end up like Middleton uh, off of the belt line between uh, the belt line and their old, um, yeah. I can't think of parameter or parameter, whatever yep. it is, yep. uh, which is just insanely dense. And, and, I, and I, I can just see that as being a, a nightmare down the road for, uh, safety issues and, and a number of different things. Uh, I don't want to see this happen to this community. I, I, I do not want to see that. Okay. So I guess we can talk internally about how we might want to, you know, try to address that for you. I mean, we, you know, we have our kind of our, our goals in there as far as the new subdivisions with the 65% single family, um, you know. Is, we, is that, is, you know, that, that's another good question. Do we want, what, what percentage of this community do we want as rental property versus uh, owner occupied or, and or uh, single family? I mean, that's part, that's part of this whole discussion with, with density. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I think that some of the newer trends, even on the single family, is to have more density with the smaller lots and that sort of thing as well. Um, but we haven't really, you know, established some goals other than, you know, we kind of take them on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's not really like, planning. Yeah, it sounds like that that's not how you want to go about doing it. I mean, obviously we have some zoning codes and requirements, but, um, and setbacks and that sort of thing, but we can, we can look at that. And, you know, I think what they're going to be looking at is, you know, things like accessory dwelling units and those types of things that maybe you might see in the larger cities. You know, I'm not really sure if that's what we want down here or not, but I think that, those are the areas that they're going to look at, but I agree with you that, you know, the, the comprehensive plan really does come through this commission. So really the question is, is how do we engage that conversation and who do we have to do that? I mean, we have a firm that does a comp plan, you know, do we reach out to them or somebody else to focus on these types of issues, um, you know, to try to do it internally, I think presents, not only capacity issues, but some might say objectivity issues, um, you know, and we want to have a, a transparent process if we're going to, you know, be looking at this stuff. Um, so you, you take those things into consideration, you know, at some point, if we're going to do something like that, we almost have to budget for it. Well, we need to budget sooner than later. Right. So certainly willing, you know, to continue that conversation. I just don't know where to go, you know, with it right now. Do any of the other commissioners have any thoughts? 
The only thing I'd say is it, it seems like we're talking about two different things. Also, the, the, the memo that I'm seeing in front of me talks about what future developments might have uh, as far as impacts on city services. And then there's another uh, road to where what impacts may have on quality of life and compliance with the comprehensive plan or modified comprehensive plan. Seems like it's sort of two different things we're talking about. There's certainly some overlap. There, there's no question. Uh, you know, the quality of life, the impact on services, the, the density, the, the regions of the comprehensive plan identify areas for different types of land use. And we, we do need to have a, a collective discussion about that. Co changes the comprehensive plan really, uh, really dictate the requirement to engage your community to get that type of input and put the, the broader vision in place to help us as commission and, and staff to commission to understand the goals and objectives going forward. Um, you know, the new census data is now available or, or soon, you know, available. So it, it would not be um, uncommon for us to go through a, a large comprehensive plan rewrite or revisit it in, in pretty broad scope uh, in the next year or two. Any other thoughts from commissioners? I, 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 I'm hesitant to throw this in here since we've kind of diverged once, but I think diverged in a good way uh, since we are in discussion mode. Um, but maybe not, my comment is maybe not on the density uh but it relates to it and it's another comprehensive plan thing again as i've just been thinking about this recently is um i mean we have a comprehensive plan and then reality happens with what goes on with development or what developers come to us with uh, changes or things where they want to put people um and I was wondering about whether to bring this up now or to wait for a future agenda item or what exactly. But I'm thinking about the transportation aspect of the density and people increasing. One particular thing is, you know, creating a pocket of people and trying to figure out how to get them safely. And going back to the comprehensive plan, how to get people safely from one point to another, get them to their useful destination safely, which is something that's, you know, that's stated in the comprehensive plan. So I think we should look at that, particularly dealing with 51 and KPW and the 51 West situation. I, I, I think getting ahead of it, um, well, planning for it and, and with, and keeping that, forefront in our minds, it would be a good thing as, as far as going forward. So just staying on top of conversations, but, you know, getting, getting ahead of stuff, kind of like what Tom was saying. Yeah, and I would say, you know, to that, um, we, we have multiple conversations going with the DOT right now, um, you know, really, Relating to 51 West, you know, we've been talking to them about, you know, the intersection there um, at Rutland Dunn and extending that over. So we're, we're looking, you know, for them to possibly approve that intersection. They have indicated to us that they're going to accept the resolution that we did to lower the speed limit out there to 35. So I think that at least from a safety aspect, which is only part of the conversation, you know, helps to address that. Um, you know, and then there's the whole corridor project. Um, certainly, you know, we're still in conversations with them as far as how that interacts with 51 West and KPW 
um, on the design phase, you know, the narrowing of the road, for example, to help slow down the speed limit, um, additional, you know, lanes for turning lanes. And then they are looking for feedback for the 51 and Rutland Dunn intersection that I mentioned, you know, whether or not if that's approved, um, if that should be signal intersection or a roundabout intersection. So you can you know, contact the DOT through their website and provide any feedback if you have any thoughts on that. Um, we did um, last week, you know, I had pursued a conversation with the DOT to identify a potential location for a future park and ride. And they did um, come back with uh, three sites that they had looked at and kind of a grading system. And I did receive that report, which I can share with you. We haven't had a follow-up meeting with the DOT yet to give them any input. But you know, the idea there was is to at least reserve the land for potentially having a future park and ride, not knowing when that may occur and who would pay for it. And I can really just tell you that preliminary data would show that our land out at the substation would be probably, that would be the number one location um, for a future park and ride. So we can at least know that, you know, that land out there at some point we can plan around that and, and reserve that as a site. Um, but we don't know, you know, whether or not the DOT will actually fund that, but there might be some other potential funding sources you know, could be infrastructure money or whatever. So, you know, we are having some of those discussions. I know we don't always share them with you till we get to a decision point, but certainly if those studies interest you, we can send them out. Um, to your point, Phil, I mean, obviously traffic is, is going to be an issue and we have a lot of numbers that have been pulled from the DOT as part of that park and ride as well as part of 51 West development, um, that information is becoming available so we can at least know what our traffic rates are and you know what they were before, during, and now you know as we transition out of COVID, um, that information is becoming more readily available. Yeah, I, I just, the, and, and not to beat this, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it after this, but, um, the more I've been thinking about the Rutland Dunn thing, I'm just like, I, I really can't see where the DOT is going to let that be a, a lighted intersection where traffic is potentially actually going to stop after all the stuff they're doing with the roundabouts to make improvements where traffic doesn't actually come to a stop with a lighted intersection. And I, I'm just you know, going back to thinking about the people that are going to be over on the other side of 51 and getting them under or over 51 somehow is is going to be a need to ad be addressed sooner than later kind of thing some way, somehow, because the, the Jackson Street intersection is, I think we can probably all agree, goofy, <laughs> to use a word. And, and although there is a, you know, there is a crosswalk there for pedestrians, um, but still it's a, it's a bit of an odd intersection and the Rutland Dunn, I, I'm guessing that the DOT will want that to be an, a, a roundabout, if anything, and, you know, they're a little sketchy, especially for, you know, littler people, little or younger folks on bikes uh, trying to get across, we're going to have to come up with some way and maybe get imaginative about getting people over or under 51. Well, that's good feedback. So as, as the development progresses out there, you know, these are types of things that we talk to the developers and the DOT about. So, you know, some of it is desire, some of it is cost, some of it is timing. So we try to take that into consideration when we're having these conversations because we 
we all want, want what's best not only for us but for the next generation so that's that's all good feedback and you know part of that will continue as we get into these you know approval processes anything else on this one the, the only thing i'm going to say is is that it should be sooner than later because from what i've been hearing linden root property is about to be sold and if that happens guess what well i think the what is is you know what does that look like we have a a neighborhood plan more than likely that'll be amended because that was based on you know having a super walmart there which obviously isn't part of the discussion now um so you know what does that amended neighborhood plan look like and you know will that offer us opportunity to to address some of the issues that all the person Carvalho has just mentioned um I think that would be the hopes if it's developed and I think that's where the plan commission and the council really will have something to say about it and how much high density do you think they're going to want I have no idea um and I guess that's the point you know once it's sold I think that we'll get a better idea um but certainly you know the density is is something that we need to continue to have conversations because there's other properties for sale as well. And, you know, I think that what I've heard at least at the council is that, you know, we wanna have a mix of types of housing and in our developments and, you know, have an integrated neighborhood. So we don't wanna have, you know, pockets as you have said, and I think, we communicate that to developers as we're trying to put these things together that we we want a variety of different types of people living there and a variety of options at different price points some ownership some rental opportunities for those that can't open that can own and that you know we have kind of the ratio that is included in our comp plan is kind of our our starting point and you know we try to end there as close as we can so i think at you know at 51 west we've tried to do that kettle park west you know we really did change the look of that uh, when we rezoned it to do more single family homes out there because i think we all recognize that single family homes you know may take up more land but from a city service standpoint probably you know minimizes you know our costs um and then you have to balance okay you know city services versus density you know what are what are the priorities and are those conflicting or is there a way to accommodate both and i think those are really deep discussions not only for the plan commission but i think for the council as well um and it's hard to have those conversations at a regular meeting so i think that there's an opportunity there to to get the group together and just focus on those types of issues um, separate from our regular meetings. Because if we have it at a regular meeting, more than likely what's gonna happen is gonna be part of an approval process conversation. And I think to your point, that's not necessarily the proactive way to approach that. All right, should we move on to the next one? And that's the discuss of um, and review of the building facade and signing colors for the downtown design overlay district. And I think that kind of came into play tonight. And where do you want to start with this one, guys? Really trying to understand what role the plan commission wants to have in in evaluating. Um, colors and, and schemes in the downtown district. The overlay district was put in place. The Landmarks Commission has a role to play on pieces of it, but not necessarily colors. So the commission plays a role in that. And is that something you want to continue to do? Or is there something you would like to see changed in how 
the commission interacts related to colors in the downtown district. And, and again, it's not something we're looking for action tonight. But obviously, we're looking to initiate the discussion because we've seen it prop up a few times recently, and it seems like it's challenging for us to work through that. Any well, initial thoughts? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say it's it's a such a subjective topic, you know. Um, there's this this commission sits sits and 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 it's basically what it comes down to is it's our tastes and our opinions. Um, but on the other hand, we don't want it so strict that. We, we don't want to have something so strict where, uh, like we talked about before, like it's the military where you have, you can pick A, B, C, or D. We, we, we want people to have, uh, be able to express, express their, their businesses and with, with the color of their choices. However, you know, there's, there's limits on everything. And it's, it's, it's just really a, a tough, hard subject i mean it's because it is so you know it's so subjective to to what people's tastes are so how do we how do we go about making it you know less about what our tastes are and more of what uh you know what are acceptable parameters i mean that's really all we have to to get to not get down to individual colors like saying this door should be this color or that that window needs to have this. Um, if Mayor can you hear me, this is Todd. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I, I think, well, one, I, I a lot of the commission has changed over relatively recently, but it hasn't been that long since we went through uh, the downtown overlay, overlay district wording. Um, and so it seems it seems rather quick to be opening it back up again, but I, I think one, a couple of things that might help at least the conversations. I think that that ordinance works best when property owners come to us before they've done the work. I think where we've had the most trouble recently is where it's retroactive, where um, a, a property owner who hasn't known about the ordinance um, went ahead and painted or put up a sign uh, and then it comes before us. And that that's what creates a lot of the complications. I think where it's worked well is when a property owner comes to us and they have an idea and um, the ordinance almost becomes a way to educate them about how to um, deal with being part of a district and being part of a district that, that in particular has historic buildings in it. Um, and we just talk about the, the importance of not going crazy with seven colors or eight colors um, and kind of keeping it simple or trying to be sensitive to the architecture, sensitive to the masonry, the original masonry or to the, the buildings next door. Because um, I think a lot of times uh, property owners just don't know and I've seen the commission work really well where it's that kind of conversation um, where they come out of it and say, you know, I hadn't thought about that. And those are some good ideas um, versus us saying, well, we don't like your blue door because you've already painted a blue, um, those kinds of things. Um, and, and to just argue that it's subjective, I think there's so much more in what the commission talks about that's subjective. I mean, you just look at our site plans while we kind of quantify vegetation, we don't specifically say in the ordinance where the vegetation has to go or what the species has to be. And so commissioners are always coming up and having conversations. Well, I like, I don't think the tree should be here. It should be there. Or I think the tree should be tall versus short or not crab apple like tonight. And so um, we can say that the downtown ordinance with color is too subjective, but it comes up in a lot of other areas that, that we as a commission are evaluating the development direction of the community. All right, anybody else uh, that hasn't spoke yet? 
thank you both Todd and Tom. That was uh, those are thoughts that that I was having about this this issue as well. We attempted to have the, the downtown property owners involved in the process, as you might recall, when we actually did go through the ordinance revisions. Um, and you get you had limited interest or limited participation. Um, and, and certainly tenants don't seem to know about some of the standards as much as the building owners should have, at least when they were in, invited to participate. Um, that doesn't mean it's right for them to go ahead without checking first, but nonetheless, it is a challenge trying to figure out a way to engage either a future tenant or a new building owner, even an existing building owner, uh, before they, they undertake something that they think is fairly benign and, and not generally covered in their minds. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I don't know if it's always communicated from the landlord to the tenant, especially that there is an ordinance and that, you know, they can't just put up a sign as they might normally do in another type of town. So, and oftentimes we're not aware of the arrangement until the transaction has taken place. And even when the sign is been completed. So, you know, we at least try to bring it to their attention and bring it here after the fact and not ignore it, which even in itself sometimes creates hard feelings amongst the, the tenants, especially, and even has in the past with land, the building owners. So, um, you know, I think that trying to reiterate what's in the ordinance, I think is important. The color part is difficult. I don't believe that the landmarks focuses on colors, do they, Michael? Oh, well, they don't. They, they generally don't focus on colors specific. Yeah, I, I, on it, I mean, I honestly think, while at times we do express our opinion, um, I don't think we've ever turned down uh, colors just because we personally didn't like it. I think we really try to encourage it to be more um, to the nature of the code in terms of being compatible with the building, compatible with the neighbors. I mean, there's usually a justification that has a, some defensibility to it. But um, not that I'm volunteering, but uh, in other communities that I've worked in where I, I think they have a little bit more success being proactive with this, um, I've seen um, a greater job of some sort of welcoming wagon service for new new tenants or new not certainly new building owners too but even new tenants where um, the chamber of commerce uh, or some other group within the community because I, I don't want rodney and michael running up and down the street but someone who just says welcome to the neighborhood um, here's some things that you should know as a new resident a new business resident to the district. You know, the chamber has these services we put on these events. And by the way, there's a downtown overlay ordinance um, that's that's largely just to make sure the district is coherent and it, use the document as an educational tool, but also just realize if you're making changes, talk to Mike and Rodney first and get on the plan commission agenda. Yep, great idea. All right, any more on this one? Uh, some good discussion. I thought I heard Ronnie start out though saying that his question was um, more of whose swim lane this belongs in uh, in regards to reviewing the, the various uh, design colors, exterior architecture, should it be staff or should it be plan commission? Uh, or did I misunderstand that? Yeah, I don't think it was, I didn't present it as if it should be staff or commission. I, I think it's just the commission is charged with doing that. We're trying to bring the information to you. Um, so I, I think it would always still require the commission, whether it's our commission or the landmarks commission in some respects, uh, playing a role in helping standardize. Or I, I think we're, we're all concerned about the outlier of the buildings that come in and 
we have a bright pink building in the downtown district or something that doesn't certainly fit. So I think there's a reason for the code. Um, it's just trying to become comfortable in how we can approach the ones that um, present themselves after the fact in some regards. We always wanna, that's, that's part of what our outreach is. When we see diggers hotline tickets and other things, we're communicating with property owners. It's different when a building owner decides they're gonna paint the building. There isn't a reason for them to think about, I guess, calling us to find out what the standards might be in advance. Kind of piggybacking or piggybacking on all of this discussion is during the process of permitting a new business when somebody's applying or inquiring, is there a possible way to basically send them the information that says, oh, and by the way, you know, when they're identified as being in the downtown overlay district, I, I don't, it, it sounds like they're not informed that they're in the downtown overlay district, or, or can we just send them like a, a form or a page that just says, oh, and by the way, you might not be aware, and your landlord might not have told you, because maybe they don't know for sure, but there's this thing, and just in case, you know, and if you have questions about, you know, here's what it is. And if you have questions about it, give us a holler. It's a great idea. Uh, I think there's a number of business types that don't require local licensing. <laughs> so, so that even that doesn't initiate it. You know, if you need a liquor license or something, or so there are certain ones that do, uh, but there's a number of them that probably don't need to have city contact to open a, a retail built business, for example. Just a thought. Anybody else have any thoughts on this one? All right. Well, we'll continue to chew on this one and see what you know we might be able to do to improve our processes and and try to get ahead of the curve on it. Um, Next one um, is input from police, fire, and EMS. I know I touched on it a little bit, and so did Rodney. Um, anything in particular that you're looking for in this area? I think 12 and 14 kind of merge together as part of the discussion. Um, but if somebody has some specific, you know, certainly involving the police, EMS, and multifamily building submittals and, and getting their intake input early is going to be helpful going forward as well. Yeah, I, I would say we really, I thought did a good job with that with 51 West. Um, and a lot of the changes that were made were made before really council members and planning commission members even really looked at it. So you probably don't even realize you know, not that you, you care, you care about the end product, but we did have a lot of conversation and, and meetings uh, and utilities is usually part of the discussion as well. And then even with, uh, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, Arnett's been working on, we've had multiple conversations internally about what unintended consequences may occur with a particular design over another one. And that's one of the reasons why you haven't seen them lately. Um, and Kettle Park West as well, as some of the improvements that have been proposed actually have been beneficial in some of these areas. Um, you know, and we encouraged them and supported them when they were brought. And if other ones that didn't necessarily meet the objectives, you know, we asked him to reconsider. So we do have those conversations. Um, the next one um, is the discussion about drive-throughs, which, you know, I think we've all witnessed it, some worse than others. Um, and some action has been taken where possible. Um, others um, may not have been so far. Uh, I think Rodney has some examples here of where uh, Duncan was really the one that was causing us a lot of issues because cars were getting backed up into the roundabout. 
creating a public safety concern. We did have some communication from citizens about that. My understanding is Duncan has tried to address that. Is that what you're hearing, Rodney? Yeah, they've they've got a uh, they'll park vehicles now in a certain situations where they'll deliver stuff out to vehicles that are parked. Um, so they're, they're certainly acknowledging they're, they're attempting to modify their business model a little bit to see if that can make an improvement there. Um, but going forward, we're also looking at ordinance revisions that might um, predict stronger drive-through volumes. And, and we're actually learning of businesses that are actually being re re-examined on that. For example, we understand Culver's might be looking at a, a site that's really drive-through dependent in Oregon. And so they're looking at how their actual kitchen layout and drive-through configuration and all of it is evaluated differently because of the large volume and shift to the drive-through traffic continues to escalate. So um, I think we'll be looking at ordinance changes going forward to help make sure we protect ourselves and have a safe, safer environment for the drive-through character uh, type businesses going forward. We certainly don't want them encroaching into the street if at all possible, how the pedestrians interact with them, how the bike bicyclists and, and even customers interact with the drive-through lanes is something that we hope to be able to look at more closely going forward. Yeah, and I thought this group had a nice conversation, you know, as it related to Starbucks about striping and signage and things that try to address some of the issues that you just talked about, Rodney. And so far, I haven't really heard of anything as far as any issues there. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Um, I know Culver's is looking corporate wide at um, a new app system that they could put in place so people can pre-order online. And then when they when they pull in, it would notify um, the restaurant that they're there and they can run the food out. So they'd never even have to go in the drive-through lane. They could go into one of the parking stalls and have their food directly brought out. And I know that's getting to be more common with some of the other restaurants and even non-restaurant retail businesses. If you've been up to, to Walmart, you'll see they have a massive area now where they have pickup. Um, so when people get there, they can, you know, they don't even have to go in the store anymore to get items delivered to their car. So I think there's a, a trend and hopefully, you know, that'll help in some of these situations. Um, I don't know if we can put those types of requirements in the ordinances or not. It would be interesting to see if, you know, if there's any limitations, what we can, what we can, you know, put in an ordinance to, to make businesses do that. I think the one that is still on here that, you know, the KFC Taco Bell one, um, that one is kind of a tricky one. And, you know, at least for now, if they get backed up, it, it causes issues on that street. I'm concerned what's gonna happen. Um, you know, if 51 West develops and that becomes a main, you know, street there, um, how we're going to address that one. So I guess that's the one I'm most concerned about. And I don't know if we have a solution yet, Rodney, but um, I think that, you know, within, you know, the next year or two as that develops on the east side of 51 West, that could be problematic for us. Yep. <clears throat> if I, I can chime in a little bit here. I mean, I think we've taken the steps that we can proactively as relates to, I mean, we can keep looking at the ordinances, but um, from a site planning perspective, you know, we, like you said, with Starbucks, we've already started to look at these issues and there's, there's only so much that we can do from a site plan perspective though, from the, I think some of the challenge that some of these businesses are having um, is internal and management and staffing issues. Um, you could have a, a significantly long drive through, but if you have um, problems with staffing and you're understaffed and you don't have good management and you're not moving product, then you can still have cars back up in the drive through. And, or you can have a short drive through with good management, good staff, and they find a way to, to deliver the food out to people who are in the parking lot. So, um, 
you know, with COVID and under, you know, the, the challenges that businesses are facing with getting good staff and hiring and, and filling all their employee slots, you know, we may still have some issues with drive throughs no matter what we do from a site planning perspective, as, as I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, I don't know, and I, I guess this raises another issue with respect to not just the plan commission and site planning, but um, are, are there other um, elements on the books from a city perspective that you can ticket businesses that have um, a, a history of this where they're backing up into the street? I mean, that might push them to improve their internal management so they stop getting tickets. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there, there might be, <laughs> but, but it is a kind of a slippery slope. I mean, is, a, is it a public nuisance? Um, so legally, we, we started to have those conversations with the city attorney, but um, there isn't a clear path for that at this point. Okay. Yeah, I think the one thing we can really look at is on the site plan is really where does the stack space go to? Does it go to an internal parking lot or does it go toward a city street? And if it goes toward a city street, I think that's where we can you know, probably try to influence them to do something different. If it's contained into a parking lot, at least it's on private property. And, it, you know, it, it's still an issue, but I think it would be easier to manage it on private property versus a public road. So I, th I think there is an opportunity there going forward. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen that a little bit more on Starbucks, but simply they just have more space there than say maybe some of the fast food restaurants that we mentioned. Um, and it really didn't become that much of an issue until COVID came. And it seems like the drive-through is, you know, a business that's probably gonna, well, it's always gonna be there. It's just, how are they gonna handle it operationally? as Todd mentioned, and I don't know if we can really control that. So I think we do have to focus on the site. Anybody else have any thoughts? Just that one more time we can, during our conversations with people who come in with these site plans, we can use it as an education opportunity. Um, to not only make sure that the overflow stays on on their lot, but also we can ask them about whether they've thought about parking lot service and and call aheads and all that kind of stuff. It's at least it's an opportunity for conversation. Yeah, it seems like that's the way the technology is going. Although there's been technology. I mean, I was in the fast food business back in the in the '80s, and we had technology. Um, to keep the lines moving. And if you go into Madison and see some of the, the ginormous chains that are operating now, you can see they really even staff outside of their facility now. And, you know, that works better when the weather cooperates, but certainly, um, you know, there is ways of doing that. And it really comes down to the individual operator. And the question for us will be with the city attorney is, can we impose can we impose on their operations? Can we go beyond the site? I don't know that answer. But you know, when it starts getting it out into a public road, I think we have to be able to do something because you know what we experienced really wasn't an ideal situation. Fortunately, as far as I know, nobody got hurt at any of them, but you know, anytime you're doing that, and then, you know, we know that we're going to be increasing, you know, developments out in some of these same areas. We're not really setting ourselves up for success if if we're not dealing with the problems. All right. So I think that's all we had on there. I don't know what we're going to do with this if we're going to try to bring them back one by one is future agenda items, uh, how we're gonna keep some of these conversations going. We'll have to figure that out. 
Um, but if you have any additional thoughts after the meetings, you know, shoot us an email and and we'll, you know, we'll put that on our list of things to, to look at as we're doing research in these areas. Are there any future agenda items? The 2025 Jackson Street, um, that multifamily development, we anticipate having that come back to the plan commission. I believe that's the address number, but the one um, that we had the concept plan presented to us last month. Um, we'll see that in J January. We're also expecting to have a extraterritorial jurisdiction on Williams Drive um, near, um, near La Follette Park. So couple of things that we'll have on the agenda for, for sure next month. Okay. And then as well as uh, that public hearing that Michael mentioned on the former Pizza Hut building. Correct, yep. yep. All right, um, thanks everybody. It's been quite a year for the plan commission. It's been really busy. Um, Busiest year I've seen. I don't know about you, Rodney. You've been doing this while, a while, while longer than I have. Um, what do you think? It's been a big, it's been a big year. We anticipate another big year next year. Um, it certainly seems like there's there's pressure and interest, and the market's still strong. So there certainly seems like we'll have a lot of a lot of activities in 2022 as well. Yeah. So you know, I want to thank Rodney and Michael and and your whole staff, Rodney. I know Steve and Desi. And uh, Susan really, you know, Sue's really done a lot of work this year and, and, and the extra effort that the commissioners had to put forward is, is really appreciated, not only by myself, but people out in the community, you know, as much as you might not necessarily hear about it, people do pay attention to this stuff and they read about it. And, and when I'm out there, I mean, one of the things I always get asked is what's going here, what's going on there. And you know, I try to share to, with them, you know, the amount of work that you guys are going through to make this stuff happen. So uh, we do appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Um, at this point, I guess I would uh, uh, um, entertain a motion to adjourn. You got it. All right, is there a second? I'll second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Have a good night and you all know, have a good Christmas. Good night. Happy holidays, everybody. Good night. Recording stopped.